Thank you so much, Dean Filler. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really almost at a loss for words and want to double check and make sure it is me um, that you were just introducing. Um, but thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate all of your kind words. And I very much so appreciate the fact that you're providing this amazing space for law students and these guests to understand the importance and value of, of a legal career in public service. Because so many law schools and so many lawyers devalue public service and the work of public interest in the legal field. Um, I wanna congratulate Caitlin um, for your fellowship for 2021 and the amazing work it sounds like you did at the city solicitor's office. I know that my experience in the city solicitor's office was an amazing experience and the work that I had an opportunity to do and it taught me so much. And Toby, of course, not last but least. I can't say last but not least because it's hard to even say last. Toby, I really don't have words to say for you, actually, because I don't really know how you found me, but I'm just happy that the fact that you did find me because you make me a better person. You keep putting me in spaces that allow me to be a better person, that allow me to grow, that allow me to experience things and people and connect me to places, organizations and people that make not only make me a better person, I think you think that I'm going to be able to contribute something to the organizations because of my skills, because of my commitment. And I hope that that has been true, such as allowing me to speak at this, at this colloquium that's named after you and, um, and because of your work in the public interest and public service sector but it's actually allowing me to gain so much from the organizations. Um, I happen to have invited some students that just had from um, Drexel um, that I think are on, the, on the, um, this colloquium. I invited them because they just happened to be in my courtroom last week. And after they were there visiting, I called them up just to talk to them some and then they sent me a, a thank you. And then I sent them some more information because I think that everyone, I know how that first year of law school was. It was overwhelming. You think everybody is smarter than you. You think everybody knows more than you. And what you fail to realize is that everybody's struggling and it all comes together later on. And I wanted to make sure that they, just like all these students understand that, you know, that it all comes together that we're all here for the purpose. And as one of the students reminded me that I said, the law is a beautiful thing, that, but it becomes even more amazingly beautiful when you put it to the use to help other people. And I truly believe that. So Toby, I wanna thank you. I don't know why you saw, came to me in, about being a part of PULSE, the Philadelphia Lawyers for Social Equity, but the fact that you did I'm just happy that you did because it has truly impacted me and, um, and it has changed me and made me want to work even harder to help others and to help others really become better people, to help them um, be able to realize all that they can be and help them get rid of some of expungements and as well as move forward with their pardon. So I'm very much honored and humbled that you also invited me to speak today. So we're going to start some about our, my career in public service. Um, I won't restate what's in my resume because everybody can read and, um, and, and everybody, for some of you, I know Dean Filler talked some about it, but before we go too far, I just want some of you to know that Dean Filler and I realized that we both were public defenders together. And that we both, for those of you who may not have been able to hear, we realized that, that the Office of the Public Defender, and when folks say you were a public defender, back in the dark ages when dinosaurs existed, folks used to say that they had a negative connotation. But in case you don't realize it, the dean of Drexel's Law School used to be a public defender. And the judge that's speaking at the, at the Oxholm Colloquium used to be a public defender. So we're gonna give a real strong shout out to public defenders tonight. So um, as I said, I won't, have, I won't restate what's in my resume. However, to have a talk about public service, we must start from the beginning. Marion Wright Elderman said, service is the rent we pay for being. It is the very purpose of life and not something you do in your spare time. 
For me, I've always known I wanted to become a lawyer, or at least as far back as I can remember. Throughout my law school days, public service careers were actually the only careers I ever even considered. Those were the areas that sparked my attention. I don't know if I just had a limited view of the law or for me, the way I was raised, it was all about, you know, you use your skills, you use your life to want to help others. I always felt, as I said, a love of the law, even when I didn't really understand it, like when you're in your first year of law school. I later learned my love was more about using the law to help others, to make changes in our society and to fight for those folks who either could not fight for themselves or did not have the access or the means for that fight and for that battle. Where I came from, I didn't see lawyers or examples of lawyers and judges who looked like me when I was growing up but I still knew the amazing things one could do through the practice of law and through the practice of service. So I had to search out role models um, from afar and I surely found them. After graduating from the University of Florida and Rutgers Camden Law School, I was blessed to have a legal career that was extremely fulfilling. The realities for me, I believe, of law school is that so it doesn't teach you how to be a lawyer. If you do it right, it actually teaches you the law. It gives you a strong, solid foundation for which to build your legal career. And my choice was to build my legal career as one of service. As a public defender in the Defender Association of Philadelphia, this is where I learned to be a real attorney, as one would say. I learned the need for having great attorneys in this position because I saw the struggles of the people that came before me. I believe you needed the best attorneys in this positions and in these positions like the city solicitor's office and the district attorney's office. Because as public defenders, we represented the poorest of clients with the least resources and they often, and we often represented people who society looked completely down upon. I found that they were in need of the most diligent, hardworking, most prepared, and most com committed attorneys to represent them. This is just to hopefully be, um, place them in a, in a balanced playing field. Being a public defender was one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done in my life. It taught me to celebrate each victory, no matter how small. And victories for me, to be assured, were not necessarily not guilty verdicts or motions being granted. A victory was actually many times knowing your client received the best you had to give him or her that day, or that your client was treated with respect. And sometimes that was just an uphill battle and that was a fight. This position as a defender is where I first learned that the phrase that I use quite often is that each of us are better than the worst thing we've done. As a public defender, for many of you, hopefully many of you may not know, I mean, it was, a, it was grueling. You know, we had a caseload that was, was much more than the caseload is now because you had so many files. You were one attorney that came into a courtroom um, with many times 40, 50 files that you were representing. You would go into the police districts, which is where you had the preliminary hearings. And it was a real brutal environment. It wasn't walking into the beautiful Juanita Kid Stout building. It was a police district where you, if you drove, you, had to, you were at your own risk because um, you really didn't have a parking space. So you parked your car on the street in the neighborhoods where your clients had to live. And then you fought through with your files um, a police district where you were about to cross-examine the same police officers um, and you had to cross-examine them with some fierceness. And then you had to walk through the same complaining witnesses with them same files um, and convince them that you really did have to leave and try to get through those same tunnels of witnesses that you walked through all by yourself. And your clients didn't always appreciate you. Well, really, most of the times they didn't appreciate you. And so when you got that fulfillment, it was something that came from the inside because you knew you were doing what I often called was God's work. 
And people many times say, why do you say that? Because it came from something inside because you knew you were doing what others would not do for no amount of money. And you were doing it because you knew it was the right thing to do. And that for me was what I knew was my initial calling. I did it because I knew that a public defender client deserved the best representation that I could ever give. It wasn't about whether this person was guilty or not guilty. It was about making sure that all of the constitutional protections that were there for that person, that I made sure I did it with the fierceness and everything in me that that law had to make sure I represented them to the best of my abilities. After I left the Defender Association, I became an assistant city solicitor, as Caitlin has described greatly. And I worked actually in labor and employment. And in working in the labor and employment division, um, I would, as an assistant city solicitor, what I didn't know at the time is that in each position that I held as a lawyer, it, it helped to prepare me to be the judge that I am today. The city solicitor's office gave me opportunities, access, and experience that attorneys at law firms would not get for decades, if at all. I represent the police department and the police commissioners, the fire department and fire commissioners in federal court and in labor arbitrations. As a relatively young attorney with maybe five or six years experience, I was first chairing um, jury trials in federal court. I look back and think now that that was heaven. As a young attorney who all I wanted to be was a trial attorney, well, if we're going to be honest, my first love was that I wanted to be a rapper or a singer. And if you had ever heard me rap and sing, because my cousin and I just, I digress for a second. Since there had already been a salt and pepper, we were going to be sugar and spice. And if you had ever heard me, you would know that this law thing was a great fallback for me, a great second um, career, and actually should have been my only one. But to be able to be in front of a jury, and that was my stage. Um, and to say that I was five, six, seven years out of law school, and I was advocating, I was litigating for the city of Philadelphia. I was representing the police department. And at that time, it was Commissioner Timoney, and then it was Commissioner Sylvester Johnson and Commissioner Harrison for the fire department. And I had experiences and relationships, and I know that I parlayed those into the position I am in today. I was also able to help negotiate the city's labor contracts with its labor unions, things that attorneys that with my level of experience and age would never have been able to do. And it was invaluable. Like there's no dollar amount that you could ever put on that kind of public service. I had access to our city leaders and gained their respect because of my work ethic and commitment to a career of public service and my commitment to their constituencies. It was because of my position as a deputy city solicitor that I was off offered the legal counsel position to the police commissioner. Um, actually, it was because Commissioner Timoney came into the city of Philadelphia from New York read a case that I had done as a labor in a labor arbitration. It was called the cockfight case. We didn't win that case. Actually, I don't think there was no way in the world to win that case, but it was the fight. Um, and anybody who knows me know that if I don't have anything, I have a fight. That if you're ever going into a battle, um, folks would say you would always want Judge Simmons to have your back. Part of the problem is that she's probably gonna jump in front of you and she would have your front also because it's about the fight for me, especially when I know you've been wronged and I wanna make sure I do the right thing for you. And he said to me, Commissioner Timoney, that I would need you to be on my team. And that's how I became lawyer for the police department. And it was an interesting situation as a public servant because I was still a city solicitor, but I was in this limbo or this um, position where I was legal counsel for the Philadelphia Police Department but I was also a city solicitor. And I had to remind everyone that it's difficult to play this position, um, but where you really have two bosses, but I was somehow able to gain um, the trust of the police department, which is the, one of the most difficult things I've had to do as an outsider, as a lawyer, 
as a black person, as a female, um, to gain the trust of a police department that for most would say um, would be that a person like me would be one that would never gain that trust. And I would never be one to trust them. Um, as legal counsel for the police department, I work closely with two police commissioners, as I said, and I work closely with their deputy commissioners. Um, I had the experience, which, I, which has helped me be the best judge that I could be. That many of the things that I continue to hear in the police in the, as a judge, um, I, I, I have to catch myself and remind the officers that this makes no sense because I helped draft many of these policies that you tell me, um, you're telling me contrary to what I know is the case. But I, I was able to draft policies and procedures for every aspect of the police department. And part of that was because um, while police commissioner Timoney has passed away, he was a brilliant man. And one of his goals was to make sure that every policy that existed in the Philadelphia police department um, had his name on it. So even if we had to just go in and add a dot as a period or, or semicolon or a comma, that once you made a change to a policy or a procedure, it then was allowed to have that new police commissioner's name on it. So during his tenure, we were able to change every policy and every procedure in the Philadelphia Police Department, um, every one of their policies and procedures. So I had, the, I had the opportunity to review every procedure and change every procedure, even if it was just by adding a comma or a capital letter on it but I did, was able to review each one. And it included discipline and the arbitration system, the arrest procedures, and the reporting of the use of force um, policies and procedures. We even were able to implement a new electronic reporting process that was overseen by the NAACP, um, the, um, David Rudofsky. At the time, it was even Stefan Presser. It was an amazing process an experience that I can't even describe fully because as a younger attorney, it was something that was so far outside of what I could have ever imagined. I was also able to oversee as if I was at a, 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 the inside counsel for a, a, a corporation, lawsuits that other city solicitors were handling for civil rights and EEOC lawsuits. The experience I had is unparalleled and the relationships I established are invaluable. The realization of knowing that you're able to help draft a policy that will help make policing more fair and less biased or recommend a settlement because you know someone's rights are violated is empowering and fulfilling. Some of the work that I still carry with me was actually overseeing how the police was supposed to police. I'm not gonna say actually did, but was supposed to police the Republican National Convention. I actually happened to coordinate how um, the police was going to the, during that time was when Ellen Iverson was arrested. I mean, sometimes you gotta take away whatever you need to take away. And that was one of the highlights um, at the police department. Um, Ellen Iverson ended up getting into some, some, some a situation, we'll just call it. And, and the police had to be told, you know, if something happened to Ellen Iverson, when he's downstairs being, um, when he's being processed in the police department, it's gonna look a lot different if something happened to Karen Simmons or John Doe, because Ellen Iverson's, while we may not want us, we wanna really walk around and act like everyone's life has, has the same amount of value personally and in our hearts, it actually does. But if his lawsuit ever come, the dollar value will actually show something very different. So coordinating that I turn in, coordinating how we would house Ellen Iverson. The, it, it, was so, it was so different. It was so many, it was so many, like we had to weave and bob so differently than I ever would have thought. Um, but it was something that I, you got to meet people. You had to think out of the box and remind my police department in ways that I never even thought that I would have had. So I had to talk to people from the city solicitor's office, the planning with the media, so they could get the shot, but also not to be able not to overstep. Um, and remember that he's a human being also. Um, 
then we had Bill Clinton, the, the ability to be able to meet the then president Bill Clinton and someone like me who always have words, um, who I always have something to say. I have never in my life can say that I was speechless until I had the opportunity to meet Bill Clinton. And when someone says a person is bigger than life, um, and I don't wanna to tell too many war stories, but Commissioner Timoney put me in a space because of that relationship where I had the opportunity to meet Bill Clinton when he was the president. And I was there with him and I was there with John Street. And both of them looked at me and said, Karen, this is the first time in our life that you have been quiet. And I just didn't know what to say because this was the opportunity of my lifetime because he was bigger than life. And the man was standing there and I had told them all this stuff that, oh, if I can meet Bill Clinton, I'm gonna tell him this, I'm gonna tell him that, I'm gonna tell him I'm gonna be his next attorney general, all the things that he's done wrong, all the things he's done right. And on the apron of City Hall, I had the opportunity. And for the first time in my life, I was quiet. Um, and then he walked away and then I told them, you know, it was just that I was, you know, I did, I, I had, my throat was just dry. And then I had, you know, I would come back and tell them the next time. But those were the opportunities, the relationships that public service and the places and the connections that they could put you. Because as an attorney, as I stated, out of law school, maybe at that point, maybe eight or nine years, those are the opportunities that you just would never get. Those are the experiences and and that I will always have in my head that I know have helped to shape me um, and become the person that I am. Um, as I move on, I must say that Maya Angelou said, you can only become truly accomplished at something you love. Pursue things you love doing and then do them so well that people can't take their eyes off you. My goal is to have the whole world looking in on me because I'm doing the work I love and I plan to give it everything I have to make sure I'm doing the very best that I can at being the best judge I can possibly do. This is my goal. I love the work I do. And every day I take the bench, I am committed to doing the best job I can do for the citizenry of Philadelphia. I'm challenging each of you on this call, each of you law students, each of you lawyers, each of person that's on this Zoom meeting, but especially our law students. I challenge you um, to commit to joining me to doing whatever you choose to do in your legal careers and do it so good, to do it so very good that folks just can't take their eyes off of you. And when you, you can do it with your volunteer work, my commitment to public service and volunteering doesn't stop when I get off the bench. I actually believe that my work's supposed to be, I suppose to put in more hours off the bench than I do on the bench. I believe that it's my responsibility to go out into the community, to go out into the schools, to be a mentor, because I didn't see judges and folks as mentors when I were growing up, when I was growing up that looked like me. So it's my responsibility to give little girls and little boys and big girls and big boys and grandmas the opportunity to see me so that they can know that you poured into me to make me who I am so that you can know that yes you can do it I don't have to that that a judge doesn't have to be an old white man or an old white woman or an old person while I am getting a little bit older um, but it doesn't have to be it can be and there's nothing wrong if it is but it can be anything you envision it being. It can be you, it can be the person to your right. It can be any person who has the, the motivation, the drive, the commitment, the love of the law and the willingness to learn and commit to it and give it everything they have. It can be the city solicitor. You can be that person if that's what your goal is to be, but you do it so great so that when people look at you, even when they want to turn away, they can't turn away because what they see is so amazing because of that commitment and that hard work. So when we talk about volunteering, yes, you can see it from my resume, but also I hope you can see because you see me out there in the world doing it, that I've been committed 
to being a, a advisory board of the Barristers Association. And I do it with the Barristers Association because I consider them my tribe. Those, that, that, that's my tribe. And, and I know that that's the pipeline for a group of people that we need on that bench. Um, and so I, I will continue to work with them. And I hope that many of you on this, on this call will continue to work with the Barristers Association and the great work that they do. And, and where Toby brought me into with the Philadelphia Lawyers for Social Equity. Well, I'd heard of Philadelphia Lawyers for Social Equity. And for many of you on this, that's at Drexel Law School and many of the other law schools, if you choose not to go into a career of public service, I don't know why you would, but some of you may want to make a lot of money and that's okay. That's okay. That will just give you more resources to, to say, I'm going to volunteer at places. You're going to take one of um, Toby's pardons. You're going to volunteer at the pardon uh, hub. That the Philadelphia Lawyers for Social Equity has done such amazing work. Um, while I was on the board to this day, I don't know how I became chairman of the board. I, took, I don't know how I became board chair, but I am. Um, when Toby brought me in, I believe he had the vision that one day I would become board chair. Um, but I can say that the work that I do and to have a judge as the chairman, chairperson of the board of an organization that recognizes that people, yeah, people get convicted of crimes. People serve their time. But at some point, you can't say that that's going to follow you for the rest of your life. And for the rest of your life, you must be reminded of that. And it must not just remind you of it, but if we each, as we think about it, everything we've done wrong, if, but everything we've done wrong, we had to carry it around in a bag and everything we've done wrong, it, it carries as a brick, not just a little rock, but as a big crater brick. And every time you go to do something good, Somebody says, nope, carry your big bag of your bricks. And they're going to keep reminding you of it and throw that brick to you. Think about that with the work that Pulse does. Pulse is just saying, we want to get rid of those bricks because a person, they did their time. They did their, they, they paid their debt to society. And now you have a judge as the chairman of that board saying, no, when I say you're guilty and when I say you need to do your sentence, I absolutely mean that. And I mean that with everything in me. And if you violate my probation, I'm sending you or parole, I'm sending you back to do it right. But when it's all said and done, you should be able to be able to say, I've done my time. I've had my punishment, just like if you were a kid. And I know we're not talking about children. We're not going to make our child be punished forever. We're not going to remind them a hundred thousand million times you did this wrong and you're never going to be able to make, get it right. At some point, we need to say you paid, you did the consequences, and now you're going to move forward. And hopefully, as I say in my courtroom all the time, that we all have made mistakes. It's not just the folks on the one side of that bench that made mistakes. The ones on the side where I sit, we've made mistakes too. The difference is that we have to wake up every morning, put on our little cute makeup, keep it moving, and hope that those mistakes have made us better people me made me a better judge so that I can be able to be the person that I'm here to be today. Also, some of the volunteer work, as I, we've talked about, is the National Bar Association Judicial Council. That's the organization I believe that is also, I used to be chair of that organization. And through that, it has allowed me to get back into schools and do some of the work that I know has been so important um, and, and, and work with the high school college mentoring program because we have so many students that I believe can be do amazing things with college that can be the next Drexel Law School student or the next lawyer and or the next judge, but they don't even know how to do college applications. And it's not because their parents don't maybe don't want to help them, but because they don't even know how. So I, I, I actually say to all of you, these are just merely examples of integrating service into your legal careers. And there are so many others. Public service options are out there. As you can see, my entire legal career has been as a trial attorney. Your public service careers do not need to look like my career to be fulfilling. There are as many different public service legal agencies or more as there are people on this um, Zoom. The idea is to find what interests you, find what you are good at, 
find what there is a need where there is a need and be the best you as a lawyer that you can be, the best you as a person that you can be. For some of you, as I've stated, I guess you must go to the big firm and make the big dollars. And I don't blame you because we all, somebody has to do it. Um, this too, I believe is admirable because it will give you, as I said, the financial resources to do other things. I believe my career in public service has me, made me a better human. And that's what we need more of. We need all of you to be better humans. It's made me appreciate the things I have more and, made, and my many intangible gifts. It's also shown me the various ways to use my lawyering to bring about positive change and service to our communities. Years ago, I watched Tupac Shakur's movie, All Eyes on Me. And during one of his interviews before he was killed, Tupac said he hoped his music would bring about, would bring attention to the social injustices of his time. He said he wasn't saying he was going to change the world, but he guaranteed he would spark the mind that would change the world. This is all I can hope for. This is what I hope for for each of you. I know you are the minds that have been sparked to change the world. With my whole heart, I believe you are the spark that will definitively bring about change. How you choose to do it and how you use your spark is yet to be seen. But I can't wait to see the amazing work each of you will do the awesome things you have in store for all of us. So while I want to leave you students with some advice that I hope will prove to be useful and inspiring on your professional journeys. Now, some folks will say that some of the things I say and do is a little corny. Um, in my closet, I used to have um, a lot of little yellow stickies. And then I saw an old show that used to come on called Being Mary Jane. Well, I don't know for some of you young law students, you probably didn't see it. I think they took that right out of my closet. I'm a conspiracy theorist, so I believe there are probably cameras everywhere, so I don't do the stickies anymore. And they did not pay me for it, so I don't do the stickies. But what I do do is in my phone, everybody know if you have the iPhone, I don't know about the other phones, there's a section with the notes. You may not be able to see it. As corny as it may sound, I have in my notes, my meaningful quotes. And I have to use those sometimes. And in my chambers, I have little stickies that I have on my desk because sometimes you just need something to keep you motivated, something to remind you of all the great things that are out there. And sometimes you just need a push because as Toby said, the work that we do, it's hard. The pay isn't that great. But it's hard work, it's a lot of work, it's thankless work, but sometimes it fills your soul and your heart in ways that you will not know. I sent out a text blast, an email blast to some folks that I think needed to hear the talk about public service because I know they work hard. Some of them are at the district attorney's office and they're getting frustrated. And I know they're on the call because they text me because they couldn't get into the stream, the, the, get into the Zoom. But I know that sometimes the work is so overwhelming. It's so thankless. But sometimes you look back and you say, you got to say, it's been a job well done. And these are some of the things that I have to listen to. Um, I have to read periodically, sometimes daily, um, because no one's going to look back and say, thank you, job, you, judge, you did a great job every day. And you really don't need it. So to you attorneys, to you law students, um, just a few. Being an attorney is a great honor and it comes with a huge responsibility. And I want you to always remember that. The next one is each of you are special and it's going to become a matter of urgency that you also see that special something in yourself. And you need to always remember that because it may not be someone telling you just how special you are. You always know more than you think you do, but don't let that get in the way of gleaning as much as you can from those with more experience. 
everyone can teach you something, even if it's a how not to. Take it in, process it, and be better for it. Remember, life always offers you a second chance. So don't beat yourself up so much. It's called tomorrow. Next one is, you have to be a risk taker. But listen closely to the next part. But an intelligent risk taker. As you go about your law school days and then legal career, do not allow yourself to get comfortable. While comfort can be a nice and nice and pleasant, too much comfort would steadily erode your sense of purpose, your sense of self, and your dreams. Always be ambitious and strive to be the best, to be great. My favorite, never a failure, always a lesson. Because I can tell you, I have never failed at anything but I have learned a whole lot of lessons. Next one is be disciplined about what you respond. Okay, for those who know me, they're probably gonna say how dare she said this because she don't always live by it. But I can tell you, I'm a work in progress. And all of these are things that I, I'm, I'm trying to be, but I'm telling you to, you do them. And I'm a work in progress. Be disciplined about what you respond to and react to. Not everyone deserves a response and not everything deserves a reaction. For your peace of mind, do not try to understand everything. And the last couple, Congressman John Lewis, the last two are from him. Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not a struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is a struggle of a lifetime. Never be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. That's why we do this work we do of public service. And the next one from Congressman John Lewis, when you see something that's not right, say something, and do something. And I'll end with the words of Dr. King. Everyone can be great because greatness is determined by service. So I wanna thank you all for having me. I truly appreciate you being here this evening and the, giving me this opportunity to speak to you about something that is so truly um, part of my part of who I am and part of what I always want to be, which is a public servant. Um, and just thank you again, Toby, and thank you, Dean Feller, for allowing me to be here.